Thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, a great pleasure to be with you on this platform, along with uh, our esteemed guests, uh, speakers. And uh, I apologize that I'm talking through Skype. I would have loved to be uh, you uh, in, in Delhi. Uh, I'm grateful to the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis for providing me this opportunity to share my thoughts and experience. Why we see more kidnapping? Why militant groups have made more kidnapping for the past one decade? Do we need to negotiate with terrorists? I'll try to speak from my own experience as a journalist who worked for 18 years in conflict zones, interviewed the leaders and members of many militant groups in Asia. I also try to speak through my own experience as a hostage for 18 months in the hands of Abu Sayyaf group in southern Philippines from June 2012 until December 2013. Militant groups, in my observation, exhibit the same social pattern and behavior as a general human society, with their own sets of acceptable norms, identified enemies, insecurities, professional rivalries, competition, and forge alliances against common threats. So kidnapping, which is a criminal act and traditionally adopted by criminals, revolutionist movements, goes with the same social pattern. And it had become now a frequent practice by more evolving Islamic groups. The goals of hostage takers vary from trying to achieve certain political, social gains to financial benefits through hostage taking situations. Naturally, reliable statistics on hostage taking and ransom payments are not easily available. According to some estimates, between 12,000 to 30,000 kidnapping are carried out every year around the world. Most of these abductions are carried out purely for criminal profit. U.S. government counted around 1,300 cases of kidnapping motivated by Islamic militants in 2012, which makes the share of militant groups out of the kidnappings around the world every year around 4.5 to 11 percent, which is not a big percentage, but why it is our main concern, why it's everyone's main concern. Because while traditional criminals do not want uh, political gains and publicity, militant groups, on the other hand, try to get maximum benefit out of any hostage situation. Beside the financial demands, they might attempt to revolutionize or to modify government's general policies. They attempt to get monetary gains to maintain future activities or attempting to gain, to gain safe release for their captured fellow members. They also, this also helped them to recruit and to have new members. Kidnapping my militant groups had become an increasing lucrative business for the past almost a decade. According to a strategic forecast, Stratford, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb made in, in the last decade $89 million. Figures also show that ASG, Abu Sayyafi Group, made in 2016 about $7.5 million. This also that, uh, shows that the counterterrorism strategies, which were adopted after 9-11, had dried out financial sources of militant groups around the world. Kidnapping now is seen as one of the main source of income for many militant groups, such, uh, such as Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, and other groups. H hostage takers usually gather some information about their potential hostage by using some source of, sources of information, such as civilians, open source information, they easily access them to their targets, and cost benefits analysis are significant factor for kidnappers to select their victims. In my case, living with my kidnappers, their life and their fears for 18 months gave me first-hand look at how they operate, coordinate, and kidnap. In Sulu Island, southern Philippines, there are around eight to 10 communities, all called ASG. Every community has a leader who is responsible for their food and protection from 
uh, from outside Strait and even sometimes from other ASG communi communities. This leader of, of, this, of the community is in touch with the main leader of ASG, who is uh, Radulan Sahron, who belongs to one of the most influential families in Solo. And it is normal there to see a hostage or two with every community. In my case, Kasman Sawajan, who leads a community of two families, planned my kidnapping. He cooperated and coordinated with. Now I'll, tr I'll try to explain how they cooperate and how they uh, network in order to kidnap. Individuals, number one, indiv individuals who did not belong to the group, but wanted to benefit from the exercise. In my case, he was a journalist who picked up the victim. The group usually adopts this approach to utilize external resources when it lacks tentacles in the cities or outside the jungle. The resource, of, the, res, the resource is usually either a believer or a beneficiary. Then, the second chain. Along with that, corrupt elements in law enforcement agencies who usually jumps immediately and try to act as a negotiators. Uh, but at the same time, continuously in touch over the phone with the kidnappers. The second layer, the third layer, the community of civilians in the jungle that tips off such groups and provide them cover and protection. Those civilians are always aware of the hostage places and militant hideouts. They are either family members, supporters, beneficiaries, or at times people simply forced to obey the group's traditions. The fourth layer, the, sl the smaller and poorer families who join the militant community, in my case was the Kasman Sawajan community. It was, with my kidnapping, it was only two families, and later they became eight families. And then the, the fifth layer was the main leader of ASG, Radulan Sahron, who was not initially part of the kidnapping. Also, he got involved to get his standard 20% share out of any income in exchange of letting the group use the name of ASG. Abu Sayyaf group, ASG, is a perfect example of kidnapping a crime evolving into militancy using the name of jihad. Other kidnapping cases in Iraq, Syria, Pakistan, and other places shows how criminals kidnap and sell victims to ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban. And there are too many cases how the criminals used to kidnap and then they used to sell uh, the, the hostages to some militant groups. Militant, militant groups with more links and connections with other groups and with criminal, uh, criminals and smugglers since, tends to be more able to operate and kidnap. Now comes to, the, uh, to another point. Do we negotiate actually with terrorists? In my opinion, I guess yes. In fact, we should. Why? Because we need to save lives. The type of hostage takers should not be used as an excuse not to take responsibilities. Do we need to pay ransom or to agree to militant hostage takers' demands? Despite the famous statement of so many governments, we do not negotiate with terrorists, we don't pay ransom. The statistics show that ransom was paid 64% of kidnapping in the past one decade. Governments, individuals, or groups should not seem or appear that they bow or accept hostage takers demands, but serious process of negotiations should be established to save lives. However, it's not necessarily that meeting hostage takers demands encourages militants to select the same government or a group as a target for the next hostage situation. Well, here I'm not calling for uh, paying ransoms or meeting demands, but I guess more and better studies should be adopted. I would conclude by saying a successful strategies to counter kidnapping by military groups must begin by subjectively understand that every situation and every group calls for a customized strategy. We should understand and study their goals, who they target, why they kidnap, where they operate, a broad-based solution will be ineffective. Traditional counter-terrorism tools cannot alone minimize the threat. It is whenever there is a corruption, economic suppression, weak democracies, poor human rights records, 
an external or external intervention or occupation, we see violence, extremism, and terrorism. This should be addressed too. Thank you so much.